Hello everyone, welcome to day two of the End of the Island podcast here at the Head of the Charles, brought to you by JRN in partnership with Wintech and King Racing. I'm still Fergus Mainland, joined by Camilla Hadland Horrocks, and we are once again live from the Wintech and King Racing tent here at the wonderful Head of the Charles. And Camilla, day two, very similar to day one. The weather and the vibes are absolutely immaculate today, aren't they? Immaculate. Perfect word to describe this because the sun is blaring down here. We're just beyond Elliot Bridge and uh, I could not think of better racing conditions for the crews that we've had out there on the water today. I mean, even some of the athletes have told us it's been too hot, which is crazy to think that in October um, <laughs> that uh, it could be too hot to run a, a head race. So, yeah, it's been sensational. It's been really good. We started our morning. We got the, the T line, I think it is, the red line to Harvard. And then got some bikes over Anderson Bridge. And already at that point, early in the morning, crews were piling underneath the bridges and the crowds were already piling up on, on Anderson Bridge. We saw it on weeks and we can still see it at the moment out on Elliott Bridge in the distance. People have turned out for this event today. It's, it's a huge turnout, isn't it? It's huge. And again, having not been here before, um, I, I was asking someone earlier, you know, is this just because it's an Olympic year, because there's lots of names mm. racing here this weekend? And the answer was no. Like, this is what it's like every single year, come rain or shine. You know, last year certainly was not this weather, for, by all accounts. But this year, um, the glorious sunshine, I think, has probably brought out even more than usual uh, in terms of spectators and uh, yeah it's hugely busy the whole way down the bank and also in the hot spots in town as well in Cambridge in Boston downtown you know absolutely heaving here this weekend yeah massively and I think what's been so nice there's been a real buzz along the toolpath I think it's still called the toolpath out here okay. in the United States but everyone's talking about how nice it is to meet up people are constantly bumping into people and trying to keep you away from conversations from, uh, from friendly faces you bump into is as hard as anything but it feels like a real meetup. It feels like a real family event, a family occasion, and the rowing world really has come to Boston, hasn't it? And so many people haven't seen each other for no. a few months because of its placement within the calendar and within the season. Often, I think, you know, the likes of like your Henley Royals or the summer racing season through the World Cups, um, places like Lucerne, it's often people have seen each over the last few weeks. Whereas here, there's been a real break following Paris mm -hmm. um, and this is the sort of place to be. This is where a lot of these crews, a lot of these athletes, um, have seen each other for the first time since crossing a finish line uh, out in Versailles. So yeah, really cool, really exciting. And I think it just makes it that little bit more special um, as a reunion this year. Yeah, it absolutely does. Now we'll get on to some of the results in just a moment, but your coffee recommendation of the day in Boston, where does it come from? Tate like latte, which like is what latte. was on my coffee cup this morning. We are we're staying very close by, and we had a beautiful walk around Boston Common, uh, around the gardens. It was oh, just a crystal clear morning, and you know, have my little coffee in hand. Tate the the <laughs> pistachio croissant, in Superb. incredible. Superb. As good as some of the pastry that I had over the summer uh, in France. So Controversial that statement. Good, that good. The French won't be happy with that, but the Americans will be delighted. And the Americans will be delighted with some of the racing results that we have had today. We'll start with some of the results from this morning. We'll start with the club single skulls. And actually, well, a huge result for Great Britain. George Lawton of Northwich won the men's club single skulls. But it was Simone Vorperian of Green Racing Project ahead of Ariana Lee of Riverside, 1-2 in the Women's Club Single Skulls. A couple of other standout results as well came from the Senior Masters 8. We previously talked about them, but Marla Rowing Club packing a phenomenal crew with the likes of Kath Bishop, Catherine Granger, Gillian Lindsay on board in their crew, storming to victory in Senior Masters 8s on the women's side and on the men's side. It was Marin ahead of Ex Nemo with the Irish Masters in third place in Senior Masters 8s. We've also had the Alumni 8s, and we talked a little bit about them yesterday, joined by a couple of the crew from Washington University. And that crew, packed full of Olympic talent, came out on top ahead of the alumni of Brown and Yale on the men's side. And on the women's side, it was Stanford ahead of Texas Rowing Center and Brown 1-2-3 in the women's alumni 8s. And speaking of Texas, speaking of that crew that finished in second place, I had the opportunity to catch up with Kate Nifton and Rachel Rain and hear all about their experiences at the head of the Charles today. Well, delighted to be joined by Kate Nifton, Rachel Rain from the Texas Alumni Boat who have just raced, I believe, raced to second place in Women's Alumni 8. So congratulations. How was it being back on the course? 
Thank you. Um, it was so much fun. Anytime we get to race with um, each other and like our other teammates from Texas, it's just a really good time and people brought a ton of energy um, and a lot of people's first time down the Charles, so that's always really special. Uh -huh. And in terms of the crew, who was all racing? So how far back through the Texas years does this crew go? Yeah, so we actually all rode together at one point for more than two years together. So it's a pretty young alumni boat. Um, for this that goes back is uh, 2022 grad. So and I graduated in 2023. She graduated in 2022, but took her fifth year in 2023. So we were all at one point rowing for a very long time together, maybe three years, honestly. Yeah. Um, so it was just a great like feeling to be back, like Kate said, wearing the burnt orange um, and just being back together. Like it's a privilege to be in this type of environment. And looking back on your time at Texas, I mean, it's been a hugely successful few years for the Longhorns. What is it about Texas that makes the rowing program so special? I think like um, the coaching staff just does an excellent job of like they really go for a certain like type of person when they're recruiting um, and they foster a culture that's really centered around like focusing on the team but also um, putting the team first um, and I just think like over the years they have really kept that the main focus and done a great job with that. Yeah and like it doesn't also happen with like the team has an incredible buy-in uh, to what the coaches are saying and I think that's what makes them such a successful group like so that they can eventually bring on freshmen and do it themselves. It sort of operates on its own right now and it's certainly built to last. Right. And how involved or how up to date are you guys as alumni of everything that's going on? I mean it was a hugely successful summer winning another NCAA title so what does that mean to you guys seeing that having graduated from the program? Yeah, it's awesome. Um, I go back quite a bit because I'm from Austin, so anytime I'm in town, um, like one of the first things I do is stop by, go watch a practice, and it's so great that they always like welcome me back in and let me be a part of it. But I think like it's even more special since we had rowed with so many of them that won the summer. So we've seen firsthand how hard all of them work and what we you know like what it took to get there. Um, just having watched them throughout the years, so it's really cool seeing that all come to fruition. And we were chatting with the Washington men yesterday and they were saying that there was a huge amount of selection that went into the boat. They said some of the Olympians got a, a pass into the crew but then there was 5Ks and everything for the rest of the crew. Did you have that sort of level of <laughs> selection this year? I mean, I give all the credit. We have to give all the credit to Kate. Like every year, like she's trying to build a boat. Like we want to be competitive. That's how this team has always worked where we want to compete and we want to compete with the best. And so, Kate did a really good job of reaching out to, you know, our alum that are still training currently. Some are in Princeton. Um, a bunch of us are Division One coaches at other schools still in the sport. Um, and then we actually uh, brought in one of our really, really, really good friends, good teammates of ours, all the way from Germany. She raced with us both back in uh, 2021 and 2022. And she's the only uh, Longhorn that's undefeated at Texas. She's went 69 races and um, lost none when we were in school. So it was a privilege to be in a boat with her again. And just finally then, what are you hoping for for this season, for the next generation of, of Texas athletes? Obviously defending the national title, what would make you proud as an alumni watching on this season? Yeah, I think like what's so special about the program is just how it develops the athletes into people. And I think every single person that comes out of the program feels like they are changed because of it and so much of what they take into their day-to-day -day life is from what they learned um, through the program. So um, I have no doubt that that will continue to happen and they're just like some of the best people I've ever met and it just it makes great athletes but also great people so I think that would be my hope is just that that continues and I know it will. Yeah, it's, it's just great to know that rowing is growing and a lot of that has to do with Texas rowing and, the, and what they're doing out there. Uh, it's, it's extremely impressive and it's extremely proud for us to be a part of knowing that like when we left the team, like it was in really good hands. Like, And so we know like, okay, maybe our last year wasn't what we wanted in terms of the final result, but they were in great hands. Like we did our job of like making them into leaders and like continuing the culture. And it's, it's just always great to watch them and, and do the best that they can and, and know that we had something to do with it. Even our alumni who, you know, told us this when we were back in college, right? So it's great.
Thank you very much to Kate Nifton and Rachel Rain from Texas from stopping by and congratulations to them on their second place finish in Women's Alumni 8s. Well, from one race to another, we move to Women's Championship Double Skulls. I'm delighted to see it. I am joined by the winners of that event and Olympic bronze medalists, Becky Wilde and Matilda Hodgkins-Byrne. Thank you very much for joining us at the end of the island at the head of the Charles. Let's start with that win in the double today. How was it out on the famous Charles River? <laughs> I think I had a better experience than Becky. Becky's first words were, I'm so sorry when we crossed the finish line. Um, <laughs> it was Becky's suggestion to do it, and I have no regrets, but I think Becky during the race might have. We basically learned it's a lot easier when you're fit to do a race than it is when you're not fit. I'm not really a head race girl, I've decided. <laughs> it built for 2K. Yeah. How much training have you actually done since crossing the finish line in Paris? Um, we've done a few sessions on the water and just been... We've tended to we keep fit in our breaks anyway. Like we've we've not been like sat on our asses, but um, yeah, we've not done much. Uh -huh. Yeah, we've had about a week and a day or so in a boat. Okay. So well, you yeah, don't want to come and do too much because no. then you're taking it too seriously. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and how has the whole Boston experience been for you so far? It's been so much fun. Like I've never been to America before, let alone Boston, um, and I had no idea it was on this the head of the Charles on this scale. Um, so it's been so much fun just being here and experiencing it all. Uh -huh. Yeah, we've got an amazing host family, so they've really made us feel welcome. And yeah, again, like Becky said, there's nothing on this scale. Like, yes, our last race was the Olympics, but there's 500 athletes there. <laughs> like, this is so much bigger. And even compared to Henley, like, it's just huge. It's mental, isn't it? I yeah. mean, we're racing starting to die down a little bit at the moment, but there's still floods of people coming past. Yeah. And we're saying it's about double the size that it was yesterday and everything. But were you out practicing a couple of days yesterday? Were you stuck in the log jams and everything out on the water? How was, how was that? We actually got really lucky yesterday. We, I think we were one of the first boats that were um, on the water. Um, so we just about managed to avoid the jams. But um, yeah, to, <laughs> to see all the traffic was um, something else. Like We thought Henley, um, Henley Tuesday or whatever um, was busy. Yeah. This is on another scale. Yeah, well, I think from where we're sat, it's at the Elliott Bridge log jam as it seemed just seemed seemed mental and everything but what led you to head of the charles was it was it a decision that came one that's been long-term planning or what led you to come and race the champ doubles today um so um after our race in paris one of our nights out um i suggested to matilda drunkenly that we try it um <laughs> i've always wanted to do it but yeah it was a drunken suggestion and i actually entered us that night um <laughs> And then she agreed, <laughs> thinking I'd forgotten about it, um, but I'd already entered us. And um, I think Sober Us decided it was a good idea as well. That was how it yeah, came about. Yeah, yeah no, I, I definitely thought you were too drunk to remember. So yeah, yeah the next day, a couple of days later, when we found out we'd been entered, yeah. there was kind of no turning back, or we didn't think there was an option. So like, ah, oh, we've committed, like, let's just go and do it. Yeah. And how were those moments post Paris? I mean, I imagine huge celebrations and whatnot, but after what was quite a unique project for you guys, what were the feelings and the emotions after the Olympics? Yeah, it was just um, so many different emotions, like just so much like relief that we'd made it through this project, but also just like a complete sense of like pride in what we'd achieved together, the journey we'd gone on. and. I think I felt a little bit sad that it was over, at least for like last season. Um, yeah, just a whole mix of emotions. Yeah, same. Like, I think we were both very aware doing it how special the project was, and the momentum we gained like was ridiculous. I've never been part of a project that's gained that much, but also, yes, it was probably one of the hardest things I've done, and our brains genuinely ached after every session. I've never concentrated so much on yeah. trying to follow Becky um, and like just trying to make these changes, but we did enjoy it all and I think to be part of a project where you enjoy it on a day-to-day -day basis like you can't really ask for any more yeah and at what point in the year did was it decided that the two of you were going to come together and form the partnership and take the double mm -hmm. to final Olympic qualification regatta so we officially got selected in March um, but pretty soon after that I got a rib injury and was out the boat um, so we didn't really properly start rowing together until end of March. Gosh. And then it wasn't confirmed we were going to Olympic qualification regatta until after Europeans. And we had a dreadful performance at Europeans. So I think they took a p bit of a punt on us, really. I think because I was yeah. technically a development athlete, that's how they justified it. Um, obviously paid off. 
yeah, it was, we sat down at Europeans and were like, we've got 10 days, like in 10 days time, if we don't qualify, like we're done. And yeah. I think it's a horrible position to be in. And I remember being at Europeans being like, oh my God, this is it, like we're done. Um, but also when you, you're backed into a corner, you have no choice but to try everything. And I think that was the turning point for the project because once we'd done that for 10 days and saw we went from seventh at Europeans to actually be able to qualify, we both said like, right, well, we're just going to keep this attitude and see what can happen. And I think we also like acknowledge that there's not many other countries that would have the equipment like our lightweight double. And we were so lucky to have them to train alongside and through Verazi we did. So every time we did pieces, we had a crew we could see we were closing the gap on. Um, so we like we had actual evidence to know we were getting faster as well as the boat feel. And I think, yeah, we just just took everything we possibly could and really just went for it. Yeah. It seemed like the momentum and the changes and progression you were able to make week after week were astronomical. And from watching on during the Olympics, it just seemed to be magnified even more as you went through each round at the Games. Did you feel the same thing in the boat as well? Yeah, we definitely felt the momentum building. I think each day um, we we knew we were getting better, um, whether it was physically, technically or mentally. And, and we actually wrote down every single day what we'd done, what we'd improved on. So we knew we had this momentum going into the Olympics. And it was our last session at Cavisham. We did a um, speed order 2K and um, that went really well. Um, the whole team did it. Um, and that gave us so much confidence. And Matilda actually turned to me um, as we got back um, to the landing stage and she said, we're going for a medal. And so that was the first time we like both acknowledged um, what we could do. Yeah, well, well, that sort of answers my next question. I was going to say, when you arrived at Paris or when you, I suppose when you started the project, did you think a medal was possible? Initially, when it was like when it was first being tested, yes. Yeah. Um, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I think like I like we did some pieces, and then because of injury and illness, we ended up going on camp, and yeah. we were changing combinations. But the combination every time Becky and I ran it out was coming top of the sheet. So yes, it was at lower rates, but if a scratch boat was doing that and it felt the way it did and was responding yeah. the way it did, I knew there was going to be something there. Like I knew it was a big ask, but. I kind of felt that if we put everything into it and went for a medal, at least if we didn't get a medal, we'd still be in the A final. Whereas if we were like, oh, i for the A final, you could end up in the B final. And being, no. in my experience, being in a B final is probably one of the worst experiences when you think you're good enough for an A final. Um, so yeah, I think we set the bar pretty high and obviously had potentially had a long way to fall, but it did then make us very accountable that like the standard we were going for and we weren't going to like let up being like, oh, well, this is good enough when actually we could be better. And I think that was that was the thing with it. Yeah. And how has life been as Olympic bronze medalist since since that final? Um, it's not changed too much. I think like going back home and stuff is pretty normal. But then the events we've done, the things we've been invited to, that's when it's like, oh, actually, what we've done is kind of crazy and it's all a bit surreal all over again. Um, yeah, it's been a busy time, but so much fun. Yeah, it's it's a weird one. I think it's such a high pressured, like unique environment going to the Olympics. Like when you step out of it, it like now it kind of feels like something like the Olympics never happened, or it was like a million years ago. Yeah. And I remember you said someone congratulated you, and you turned to them like, "What's happened?" Which is now like you've got the tattoo on your wrist to remind yourself. And actually, I was so reassured when you said that because I just assumed like life felt so normal because I had Freddie who was just distracting yeah. me. Um, whereas actually, it's like it is a thing from like I think all the athletes like you come off this high pressure environment and you're like, now what? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think it takes a really long time for it to like sink in. Um, and like you kind of, for you to pick yourself up and be like, now what? Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a weird position to be in. Uh -huh. what, what tattoo have you got? Is it Olympic rings or what have you got? Very nice, <laughs> very good, great stuff. Well, congratulations on your Olympic bronze medals and your win in the women's championship double today at the head of the Charles. We've also been catching up with the winners of the men's championship doubles, and that was the Sinkovich brothers, and Camilla has been in conversation with them. I am here with our winners from the championship doubles girls, Valent and Martin Sinkovich. Not only winners here at the Charles, but uh, also Olympic champions from this <laughs> summer in Paris. Um, you guys are back here on the Charles again. A, a 10 year reunion from your record setting double 10 years ago. How does that feel? Oh, it's really, it feels really special. This regatta is really special. 
so many people uh, cheering for every crew to see it throughout the whole course uh, that much people and we, we are really lucky with the weather for sure and we really enjoy it and it, it, it went too long until our last visit here for sure. And so any plans to be coming back again then after that amazing experience you've just had? Of course, we plan to come back not in 10 years before. I hope probably not, not next year because the World Championship is so late. Maybe, you never know. But definitely in two years, our, my plan is to go and come back. It's beautiful here, like Valen said. We really enjoy it here and can't wait to come back. Well, before we think about next year, we think about tomorrow, because you guys are not only doing the double today, but you're also in a pretty special eights project that's taking place. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, it's really nice. Uh, uh, roaming with a breed, dub, breed pair uh, that we had that uh, great race with, you know, and now we're rowing together, and that will be really special. And the other guys, uh, with Jamie, He's the oldest one in the boat, and Anton Loncharic, he's the youngest, 24, so he has, we have a huge spread. But I think uh, we are good eight, uh, and we can fight for a win, for sure. Well, that's exciting to hear, and yeah. uh, fresh on the back of a win today, I fully believe that, uh, yeah. coming from yeah, you guys. Yeah, we, we show that we are in good form, so we can do it. <laughs> I believe you. And uh, as well, um, a number of years ago, you've been part of some amazing eights as well here on yeah. the Charles. We were talking yeah. about it just the other day, Van, and, and the great sculling eights that used yeah. to come down this course, you know, 10, 15 years ago. How much does this remind you of, of those days? Um, well, I mean, that was really a special experience, uh, rowing with the best colours in the world. In that day, we had uh, two of us, Mahe, Dreis, the Wondrasine, Olaf Tufte, and a few of the legends of our sports uh, and uh, actually we were against the sweep great eight and we beat them by a few seconds so that was really extra sweet and it, it was great experience it was the 50th anniversary of the regatta uh, so so really good memories and definitely from this year we will have great memories yeah I mean motivation for tomorrow hey if you could beat that great sweep eight back then tomorrow you're going up against you know the harvards the yeah. washington all of the the sort of collegiate eights you've got confidence then that uh, you can take them all on yeah definitely i think uh, we're on the training here the boat is going really good we are really happy how the things are going so i really i truly believe we can win we'll see we'll do the best as we can and I think, like today, we will enjoy the race mostly and enjoy the, all the great crowd and the weather will be good, so there's nothing bad about it. Right. We can, in the eight, we can relax because we have a Cox and we don't need to think about anything. He's just leading us. Just push hard. Yeah, just I push thought you hard. were like, I can just relax. I can just no, no, in double, you know, you need to watch, uh, watch, <laughs> uh, watch for everything, where to go, you know, all corners. Because the, the steering is really tricky in the double, right? Yeah, we were hearing from, um, we had Matilda and Becky on who won the women's championship double. They were saying the steering, if you've not got a rudder, is particularly hard out yeah. there. How did you find, who was steering and how did you find no, it? No, we didn't, we were, in the double, we didn't have a rudder. You, so you went rudderless. Yeah, Wal Valent was in charge for looking ahead and see where to go and which which arm to push harder. And uh, he did a great job. Well, I think we had perfect curve in the all the curves. So I think I think it was great. Amazing. And quickly, you know, we, we touched a little bit on Paris. Um, what have you been up to between then and now? Um, have you done much training? Have you been back in the boat? Uh, yeah, tell me a little bit about your, your break. Yeah, yeah, I was, uh, I spent a lot of time with the family. We've been on vacation in Croatian, Croatian Sea, the coastline, and we enjoyed it for one and a half month. Nice. But I, I, did, uh, I did some training, just some running, a uh, few, few times a week. And then uh, we had a, ch a national championship a uh, week ago or two weeks, two weeks, two weeks ago. ago. So we a little bit trained wow. for that. So we are in training. We train once a day now and we like it like, like that. And we probably will train like this till the end of the year and then we'll start to go back in the normal training. Amazing. And yeah, very too. quickly next year, 
what are the plans back are you back racing for the Croatian back team? racing will roll and probably in the four in the four Probably thing you want to ask and you want to hear. Yeah, Probably the four and I'm we'll try. I'm excited for the Croatian yeah. four. I can't Definitely. wait for it. Hope it yeah, will be we good. Never, we never wrote four, so. Yeah, we never wrote a challenge. really good four, so. New challenge. No? Here we go. Yeah. Well, look, thank you so much, both thank of you. you. I know you've got to get off to a medal ceremony yeah. now. So congratulations once again. Great to have you here at the head of the Charles. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Camilla, for that wonderful chat with the Sinkovic brothers, Martin and Valent, of course, winners of championship doubles here at the head of the Charles Regatta. Now, speaking of results, we've had lots of racing to go through and we've picked out a few of our favourites from this afternoon's session as well. We will start with the club aids. On the men's side of things, Brown topped the rankings ahead of Dartmouth and Riverside. And on the women's side of things, Yale came away with the first place ahead of our friends at Radcliffe Crew with Princeton in third place in women's club aids. We've also had the championship single skulls today with Finn Hamill of Waikato Rowing Club taking the win in that event ahead of Javier Garcia Ordonez from Sevilla and Polo Donovan of Skibbereen Rowing Club. On the women's side of things, Michelle Sexer has made it back-to-back -back titles, winning in 2023 and 2024 ahead of Cara Kohler and Savannah Bria. In the mixed double skulls, Ollie Ziedler and Sophia Meekin came away with the win in that event. And in the mixed para PR3 event, it was the United States para rowing crew that uh, topped the pile there ahead of the Brits, many of whom were in the medal, gold medal winning crew from Paris. So a huge result for the US para rowing crew in the mixed PR3 para event this afternoon. But Camilla, we've got so much to look forward to. We've still got another day of racing here at the head of the trials. What are you most looking forward to on the roster tomorrow? I think it's the youth events starting off tomorrow those events where lots of international competition uh, making their way over here to Boston um, lots of British interest that we know about uh, will be kicking off in the youth eights but going up against very stiff competition locally from the USA as well so all of those youth categories kicking off tomorrow very excited for that um, but also excited for the the championship equivalent mm. events the championship men's and women's eights also starting tomorrow which the best of the best, the, the creme de la creme uh, of the Charles coming out to play tomorrow. Yes, yeah, so much to look forward to. And in the youth side of things, St Paul's School coming over from the UK to defend their title, which the head of the Charles kicks off almost the quadruple is what we call it in the UK. Head of the Charles Regatta, schools head of the river in March, national schools, and then Henley Royal Regatta. So they'll be looking to win that again this year. But they've had a bit of travel issues, have the defending champions. We've been hearing all sorts of updates from them, as have we. I was about well. to say, much like ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think St Paul's got unlucky with their travel. They were meant to be mm. on the same flight we were on, which was cancelled, uh, as were a number of other sort of crews and, and schools and clubs. Um, but they unfortunately got shifted via Europe, as I understand, <laughs> um, <laughs> continental Europe yeah. somewhere. Um, and then I think now finally made it stateside, but that would have shortened their preparation time a little bit less time to, to get bedded in and, and sorted uh, with equipment, with, you know, getting the feel of the river. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm sure, you know, there's a few guys in that boat that have been here, won this before, know yeah. what it feels like. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure we'll see a great race from them, as will we from most of the other comp uh, schools that are competing in that youth eights as yeah, well. Yeah, some seriously stiff US opposition as well. St. Joe's, Greenwich, the likes who we've seen competing across the country and have been so dominant for a few years gone by. But just finally on the championship side of things, I mean, we've got the very best that the US universities have to offer, which is incredibly exciting, both on the men's side and the women's side of things. But there's some interesting entries as well coming in. I mean, Leander Club on the women's side of things is a particularly exciting eight, isn't it? It is. You know, so many of that eight have been competing at the Olympic Games. It isn't the full um, women's eight that won bronze at the Olympics, but it has, you know, I think, the majority of the crew, Emily Ford, Ram McKellar, Esme Booth, um, all here contending in that eight, Annie Campbell Lord, plenty of them. So at least half the boat. Uh, Henry Fieldman also in the Cox's mm -hmm. seat for them too. So that will be um, a very intriguing lineup, depending on how much training, how much fitness, how much they've been able to come together. I know that they're boating from up at the BU Boathouse um, and have been sort of getting, again, attempted to set up and in new boats, new blades, all that yeah. kind of thing, which when you're 
still dealing with Olympic athletes, right? With different spans, um, you know, often much bigger, you know, feet for the shoes, all that kind of stuff can be challenging to get yourself set in and bedded up and, and have that best race out there on the day. Um, but I have no doubts that the Leander coaching team has got them ready to roll by tomorrow. Absolutely. And I think just one on the men's side as well, I mean, as we've mentioned, we've got the top US universities, Harvard, of course, defending champions on the men's side of things. But there, again, there's another particularly interesting, it's the Colvin Training, Colvin Training Center, I believe, and a real mishmash of some of the best athletes in recent years on the international stage. Yeah, I mean, this is what this event is all about. It, it kind of reminds me of the great eights of years gone by. And, you know, we've just been chatting to the Sinkoviches, that great sculling eight yeah. and the great sweep eight that we used to see sort of 10, 15 years ago taken to the stage. So it's, it's kind of reminiscent of that. We've got the Sinkoviches as part of that crew. We've also got um, the, the pair that came second to them at the Olympics, uh, Tom and Ollie, um, who I, Tom, part of the Princeton Alumni 8 today, so doubling up this weekend. Big weekend of racing. Big weekend of racing <laughs> uh, for them. So, And I think Michael DeSanto's in that as well, who's been in the, the US team in years gone by. So yeah, big names, but I think in terms of training, and race fitness, <laughs> but you know, I, I'm, it's going to be questionable. I think the Sinkoviches may be, based on their double result today, yeah. pulling a lot of those guys down the course. Yeah, lots to look forward to in the youth events and the championship eights as well. That's what we've got our eyes on, as well as everything else that will be unfolding down the course for day three of the Head of the Charles Regatta. But that will bring an end to today's episode of the End of the Island at the Head of the Charles Regatta. We'll be back at the banks of the Charles to do it all again tomorrow.